Hi, it's David Shomey, and I've got a great guest with me today who's come all the way from the United States, uh, Brian Buell yes. from uh, Logan Graphic Products. Uh, he's the sales manager uh, at Logan, and right. he's going to demonstrate some uh, cutting equipment and some new features that, uh, and talk about a few things that uh, Logan is doing to help the hobbyist and the bespoke picture framer make better picture frames. Anyway, great to meet you, Brian. Great to meet you. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah, fantastic. Good. I hear you had some good fun with the fireworks the other night here yeah, in I did. Brisbane. Yeah, <laughs> Brisbane was doing this big show. I got to see it. It was uh, it was fantastic. I had no idea it was happening uh, until it started, but uh, I got to see quite a bit of it. So. Oh, awesome. Staying well, right downtown, got to see the whole deal. Great. And uh, you're going around Australia doing some demonstrations to, to demonstrate am. Logan product? I started about a week ago. We worked Melbourne, Perth, uh, we're here in Brisbane now, we're headed to Sydney in a few days and finishing up, then I'm spending about an uh, additional two weeks holiday. Wow, that's great. Yeah, so you're going to get to see a few things at a nice time of year yeah, as well. Yeah, fly my girlfriend out, she's meeting me in Sydney, and uh, then we're going to go see all different sorts of things. So we're real excited. Oh, fantastic. Anyway, I've um, sold Logan product since about 1991, and mm -hmm. that's when you sort of joined Logan. So we we've both we've both been in it a, a long time. A long time. Um, one thing I've noticed uh, throughout the time is pretty much any of the Logan product I could just open out of the box mm -hmm. and it just worked. Mm -hmm. um, I could count probably on one finger how many returns I've ever had. Good. And usually that might be because someone's put two blades into the yeah, cutter instead of, instead of one. But uh, yeah. amazing quality. And you well, know, thank you. Companies like Lego have difficulty in getting all the parts and components into a <laughs> box of Lego, yet your stuff's pretty flawless. How, how do you deal with that? If you've got good quality control, you must have good quality control. Yeah, uh, our, you know, our factory is full of a lot of people that have been there a very long time. I've been there since 91, but there are many people, uh, people who are doing research development, engineering, and assembly, and final packaging that have been there far longer than I have, and they really know certainly what they're doing. And we've already sort of designed equipment from the aspect of making things for DIY people, what we call DIY. So we try to make it as easy as possible where you could literally take a machine out of a box and train someone in a couple of minutes and they're cu cutting mounts uh, yeah. right away. No, it's fantastic. Well, I, I know that the um, in, in America, of course, there's a very big uh, prepper market with everybody in, in that sort of market, the survival sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people are really, really keen on doing it themselves as well. Mm -hmm. So, yes. you know, I, I think uh, we've got a really rosy future ahead with the DIY market, mm -hmm. and uh, I know we would talk before we came on here about how some of the craft shops aren't actually promoting uh, the cutters enough, mm -hmm. when really it's not just about saving money, but about having fun mm -hmm. with, uh, with what you do, and really mm -hmm. the rewards of actually making something yourself uh, probably true. far outweigh you know even any costs. That's saving. True. And, um, it is. I mean, it is a, a massive cost savings when you do it yourself. You'll pay for the equipment very quickly, so long as you use it. I always tell people that if you buy the tool and it sits in your closet, it's not going to not going to save you anything. But if you use the tool just a few times, you will quickly pay for yourself. And there is a lot of personal sort of accomplishment of taking a piece of art that perhaps you created or a digital photograph, uh, a photograph, and framing it and putting it on the wall yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think there's a strong that strong movement in uh, bespoke as well yes. and I think that will continue to grow as people sort of they might you know they've seen all that mass-produced uh, mm -hmm. stuff and really you know that mass-produced stuff isn't personal mm -hmm. and I think it's that personal bespoke stuff whether it be the professional framer or mm -hmm. the hobbyist who wants to make or get professional results mm -hmm. and I think that's where I've always found these tools so good is that they they actually get on par professional results. Yes, they do. At, in that's many right. cases, like a tenth of the mm -hmm. cost or even a greater right. saving. Uh, it's very surprising to people who assume that uh, mat cutting equipment uh, is very difficult to use. They say, "Well, I'm not any good with math. I don't know how to pick colors. It's too hard for me." There's sort of this intimidation factor that we've always. Uh, strive to overcome as a company because people just may be timid about using it but you know if you can give me five minutes in front of some people with a the machine uh, they see how easy it is and then it, everything changes for them and so we do our best to encourage that with a lot of videos that we have online we put a lot of time and effort into shooting many many videos on individual products and how they work along with a lot of how to single double mats offset corners 
uh, how to uh, do basic maintenance on your machine. So we try to put as much out there as we possibly can to show people that it's not that difficult to do. This is a viable alternative than to paying someone else to do this framing for you. Yeah, excellent. Well, uh, this machine is relatively new. Uh, uh, it's certainly new in the Australian market. Mm -hmm. um, we'd always had used the uh, Logan 301, mm -hmm. and uh, now this 350 has come along. I'd really appreciate it if you, you'd show some of our certainly. guys how it works and some of the new features that it's got. Certainly, this is uh, our compact, what we call our Elite uh, version compact, the number 350-1. This comes from our most basic board mounted mat cutting equipment line. So this is sort of an introductory level. People who are at home that are maybe doing a handful of mats each month. Uh, it does not have the capacity to accept a full sheet of mount board, but you can put the short side of a full sheet of mount board through this. And the way you would do that is you'd lift the, the hinges up on the guide rail here and the material would, would go right through. And it has a bevel and a straight cutting head. The bevel cutter is for cutting your, your beveled openings, of course, and the straight cutter is really what you use first to downsize or blank your mounts into uh, blanks like these we have right here. Yeah. So it uh, also has things like a parallel mat guide, which is what's going to set the width of your border. It does have some production stops on it to speed up some production mat cutting, which is really repeat mat cutting. It's not there for stopping over cuts so much, but production stops are there to speed up repeat cuts. So if you have a handful of mats to do, and oftentimes artists may do a piece and have it reproduced maybe 50 times, it's a limited edition piece, they have 50 mounts to cut, a machine like this that has production stops is a huge advantage. It really speeds up the, uh, the process of cutting mounts and gives you more time to paint or shoot photos or whatever, whatever it is that you do. It also has what's called a measuring bar on here. This is a device that uh, allows you to cut your blanks down to size very quickly as opposed to having to mark lines out with a pencil using a ruler. You can just set the side of your blank on the number, pull it across with your straight cutter, and uh, you've downsized it very quickly. So it's sort of a introductory level mat cutter, mount cutter, but it has a lot of features that come from some of our professional equipment. So it does quite well for us, and it's really good for people that are just starting out. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd always noticed, even uh, with the uh, 301, that you really could cut much larger than the machine by shunting around and yes, you can. some people would, would use that to be able to cut very large mats. You technically can though, do that. Even though it, you couldn't necessarily cut all mm -hmm. the way around it, uh, right. certainly you can cut the window with it. So That's very, right. I've found a very versatile machine and certainly now that you've added um, the production stop feature, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's a professional type addition for yes. Uh, yeah, I could see where that photographer or the person who's doing the weekend market or something like that where they want to do that uh, multiple production. Mm -hmm. Fantastic addition. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's got so many good features on it uh, mm -hmm. for just a simple machine. Uh, anyway, show me, how, show me how it works. Okay, I just need to trouble you for a pencil. That's the only thing that I don't have. Oh, a little bit blunt that one, but I'll sharpen one while we're talking. Okay, this will work. So your mat guide here is a device that's going to set the width of the border on your mount. So depending on where you set the mat guide, that is going to determine how wide your border is on all four sides. So it is not determining the opening of the mat board. It is determining the width of the border. So regardless of how big your mount is, small or big, whatever you set your mount your mat guide to, that is the size border you're going to get. Mm -hmm. So your scale is right here, and we, we produce the scales uh, in both inch and metric because we do sell these all over the world. And the sticker says set scale from this side. So you're going to find your reading on the outside here. And I'm going to start, we're going to do a double mat. Okay. And I'm going to start with a seven centimeter border. So the idea is you sort of want to split that line in half with the edge of your mat guide material. Yep. Tighten both sides down and it pulls itself parallel to your mat guide, to your guide rail. This is your slip sheet, which is a very, very important thing to use whenever you're doing bevel cutting. It always protects the face paper of the mount board when you're cutting face down from the back. So I'm going to just get my stop out of the way. So off color side down, up against your mat guide, and then it comes down against your squaring bar, and it sits in this nice 90 degree corner down here. Set my guide rail down, I'm going to use a pencil. I'm going to mark lines along the back of the mount board on all four sides. And you notice I sort of hold the pencil at a little bit of a 45 degree angle, mm -hmm. because we want to make sure that the pencil tip is right down along the bottom of the aluminum. You notice I've also marked all uh, four sides past each other in the corners. They go past. You don't want to stop them. Mm -hmm. 
and actually cut your mount. You take your bevel cutter here. This is a push style cutter that comes with this level of equipment. As you move up, they switch and they become pivot and pull styles. But at this level, it's a push style. So here's your blade holder right there with your retractable blade. Sort of a spring action in there sort of as a safety device. So when you're not using the tool, it's not going to cut down into anything. We've got two little clips on the front edge here that are slotted. We call these the nylon guides, and they hook right onto the side of the guide mm -hmm. rail. Then on the back, the most important thing here is our start and stop indicator. Mm -hmm. That's going to tell us where we start our cut and where we stop our cut. So I just hook this right onto the side of the rail here because it guides itself. I'm going to start with the... Make sure it's nice and tight in here. I think I'm just going to take this measuring bar out of the machine because you really only use this when you're downsizing the okay. board. So. everything into the machine. I start with my pencil line and the start and stop indicator directly over the top of it. And you want to make sure that they do not separate. So I sort of hold with one hand at the cutting head so it doesn't move. Take my thumb on my right hand, give that a good push so the blade sinks all the way yeah. in. And you're going to take your left hand and put a little bit of pressure on the guide rail so things don't slip away. You're just going to push and you're going to cut from line to line. When you get to your other line, it's very important that you always pop your blade up. Don't leave your blade down when you move your uh, your cutting, otherwise you'll tear out your corner. So again, you just repeat the process on all four sides. I'm lining up my two lines, popping the blade down, putting some pressure here, and cutting from line to line. And when you're doing this cutting motion, and you can see here we're halfway through the mat there. When you're doing this cutting motion, it's really just important that you get the blade down all the way down with your thumb, and you need yeah. to keep pressure on here. You're not really having to push down on the tool as you're making the cut, because the blade is sitting where it needs to be. All you're worried about is just sort of sliding it forward. And when you get to your far line, stop and drop the blade out. Yeah, one thing I've found with, uh, certainly with elderly people using the machine, when they first start, they, they tend to think they've got to exert a lot of force between their Two arms. That's right. Doing the holding. That's Whereas right. Once they get grab the concept that they can, the the bar is going to be square and going to hold. They don't need to put that much pressure, and really they're pushing along the rail. And I sort of give them that Tai Chi kind of <laughs> push. Right. And once they get that, they really uh, they they don't find a lot of difficulty in using a machine like this. No. You know, it's not. It's not as if they need an incredible strength no. to be able to cut the board. Which the is only real tight. resistance that you feel is the blade passing through the mount board. That's really the only uh, effort that you have to put into the machine. And uh, it's true, too, that if you've not used a, a mount cutter ever before, the first time you use it, it's going to feel a little strange on, on your fingers. And you sort of have to learn where to put the force with your thumb and where to, where to actually use the strength of your hand to make the cut. But within a few cuts, it becomes much more natural. So shouldn't worry about the first cut if you don't get through or something try it again probably never happen again so Absolutely. you can see here so we've got our beveled uh, opening here fantastic that's one of the advantages of actually coming into a uh, a store and actually buying one of these pieces of equipment that you can actually get them out of the box and try them that's one mm -hmm. thing logan right. products always been able to be got out of the box demonstrated looked at yes. not ashamed of sort of you know making this impenetrable package that you can't <laughs> get into yeah and the other good thing is of course uh, if you come in and you you get a demo we always give you a collection of boards anyway offcuts things that we're using oh, that's fantastic. so that, you do that. Pe people can grab a bundle and go home right and also we give them quite a few uh, slip sheets and encourage right. encourage people to keep every offcut because this, exactly piece, right. this piece here is going to make the next Christmas present or something else. That's and exactly right. Very uh, economical when you actually get into it and do a mm -hmm. lot of things. So where do we go from there, Brian? We're going to make a double mat here, mm -hmm. or a double mount. This is my top mat, so I'm going to set this aside for a second. Then I'm going to do a liner mat. A liner is the one that's behind the top mat that you cut. And we'll use this lighter color here. But the first thing I need to do is I need to make sure that my liner is a little bit smaller than the top mount. Okay. Right now these blanks are all the same size, so I just need to cut this down a little. And because this is going to be on the back of the mat board, I can do a real quick, easy way to do this. Is I'm just going to tuck a little bit of it underneath the guide rail here, and I'm going to use my bevel cutter sort of as a sizing tool. I could put the blade and, and set up the straight cutter, but in this case it, it doesn't really matter. So I've only put a little bit underneath the guide rail. It doesn't even matter if it's sitting squarely. I'm just going to sort of use this as a sizing tool. You can set just sort of cut a chunk yeah, off one side here, yeah. turn it a quarter turn. Again, just put a little bit underneath the guide rail. Doesn't matter if it's straight. Use your bubble cutter as a trimming tool. 
cut these two sides off and now you can see that it's certainly smaller than my uh, top mat is. Mm. So now you want to sort of clear a little space on your work area here. You want to lay your top mat down first with the window in place. It's always very important that you keep the window and don't lose track of this. So lay this face down. See something that I, I when, whenever I'm demoing a machine like this, one thing I always do is I show the, uh, the fact that usually that window will actually, oh, sorry, just want to, just want to rip, rip that one. It's a little bit different to the one you use. If you show me how this one works. Uh, we, we'd actually put it down and, and then take it oh. off, take, take, okay. take, take, take it back off the, off oh, yeah. the board. That way you'll, your you'll get it on there. Okay. Some of the ones that are on the, uh, on the dispenser, like we've looked at before, they are a little bit, um, yeah, there you go. There we go. So all I'm doing here is I'm applying this tape, uh, which we call ATG in the States. I'm not sure exactly what they call it here. But it's sort of a backless tape. It's not really double-sided so much as the paper really uh, drops away and the adhesive transfers off the paper onto the back of the mount board. It's a terrific product to use for doing double mounts or even mounting photographs onto photo mounts. You can do, mm -hmm. uh, use this stuff for a lot of different things. So I've got tape on all four sides. Now you notice that it's important that we stay away from where the cuts are. We're out in the middle of the borders yep. where we're doing this. And the last little bit I do here is I usually make a little square shape just right in the middle of the mount board. Let me try the other side here. Yeah, that's good enough. And this is so the windows will stay together when I'm going to be doing my, uh, my actual cuts. One more little piece this direction. That should be good. Yeah, this, this one is actually quite an aggressive, um, it is. aggressive, an aggressive double-sided. They, they, they call it double-sided tape or the ATG tape adhesive transfer tape mm -hmm, and right. often the professional framers will put that into one of the guns which you would have seen That's right. like the dispensers. Mm -hmm. um, which yeah, the guns are really nice too and if you're doing a, a pretty good volume of double mounts, get the gun. But yeah. you can use it by hand and save yeah. some money if you need to like we're yeah, doing today. Absolutely. So this is why I, I cut the liner mat down. So my top mat is face down windows in place. We have the tape on all four sides and a little X shape in the middle. Now this is why I cut the liner down because if I didn't I would have to very carefully be trying to line up these pieces of mat board together yeah. and not allow the back one to extend past the first. But because we cut it down a little bit quite easily it drops right in the middle and you yep. just kind of give it a slap and it will stick in there. So when you lift this up you can see the window now stays in place. Yep. Now these first borders we cut were at seven centimeter. So I'm going to cut some wider borders so that we can see part of the liner mat. So the border that we do next must be bigger. Yep. It's got to be bigger. cannot be smaller. If you set the mat guide the wrong direction, you will have a double mat. But you won't see it because it will be behind the first uh, border. So I had my first border here set at 7, which is right here on the mat guide. I'm going to set it out to 7.5 centimeter. And then retighten. Again, make sure my slip sheet's in place. Now, technically, the window on the, the top mat is now acting as my slip sheet, and if I wanted to leave this out, I could. Typically, I don't worry about it. I just leave it right in the machine. Mm -hmm. Put it all back into the tool here. With my pencil. Mark four more lines. my bevel cutter and you just sort of repeat the process. It hooks onto the side of the rail again. You're going to line up your two lines. I hold the cutting head still with my left hand. Use my thumb. Give that a good hard push to yep. get the blade seated in. Just put some pressure here so things don't slide. I'm going to cut from line to line. And make sure you just pop that blade out every time you finish a corner. One thing I like that you do there, Brian, that I haven't seen done before with this machine is leave the cutter on the rail when you lift it up. Mm -hmm. um, I was very much always telling people, yes, lift the uh, the blade up, but right. mostly lifting the cutter back mm -hmm. off the off the track. But I like how you leave it there. That's quite an efficient thing because it, it, it's staying in place. You don't have to worry about picking it up and moving it around. You do find as you use the cutters, you'll find little shortcuts. Yeah, they just sort of come to you, and yeah. you don't even necessarily know that you're doing them. But this will hang on the rail if yeah. you're sort of gentle with it, and you don't have to have the process of taking it off and putting it back on again. So, lining up my line, 
cutting from line to line. Okay. Now, my last cut here, what will happen is the two windows, which are taped together because of that X shape that I made, will fall out taped together. Yep. Here's my two dropouts. And what's remaining is a perfect margin double mat. Yeah. And it did not matter how square my outside mount was or how square the back was, or even if I had applied it squarely. Yep. This process absolutely forces this to give you a perfect margin on all four sides. So sometimes people are under the impression that you cut two mats separately yeah. and then try to line them up, and then that's just near impossible. That's yeah, yeah. very difficult to do. So this is the technique that framers do to do a, a double mat or double mount, and it can be done on any of our Logan equipment. It's not really about the equipment, it's just the technique. Absolutely. One thing I've always noticed um, in terms of quality with Logan is the there, there, there are no overcuts. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is something that, on and, and I know with production stops that often picture framers who wanted to work quickly might set the stop a little bit long so that they're definitely falling out. Right. Whereas with the visual line that mm -hmm. you've got on there, and that it's something that I, I always encourage people to draw a line. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me how accurate uh, mm. Logan equipment is. And I mean, that is an incredible job for just a very, very simple uh, piece of equipment. Uh, anyway, one of the other things that uh, you've just released, which is something that I'm sure uh, professional picture framers would be using because they, uh, there's a very, there are different methods for actually finishing the back off of picture frames. Like yes. a, lo a lot of people here in Australia actually use uh, various tapes, but mm -hmm. we still use a lot of brown paper and dust covers. Dust um, covers, right. And I know for, uh, you know, where sometimes we might use it with canvases or other things where we actually want to put a uh, brown craft paper yes. to seal it. And I, I'd seen that you'd come out with this, this new tool, which was uh, the dust cover trimmer. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of tell me a little bit about, uh, well, I, I can sort of understand why, but tell mm -hmm. me a few features. I, I had a quick look at it, and I'm, I'm curious about the little extra screw that's sticking out as well. Okay, I can tell you about this. This is uh, very new. We released it earlier this year. And essentially, this is a tool that's used for trimming the dust cover paper, which is the, the back paper that goes under the back of the frame. And uh, it gives it a nice professional look because it trims it just to the inside of the edge of the outside of the, of the frame itself. So it looks really professional. So. Uh, it's not that difficult to use really at all. All you use is uh, like a craft paper can be used as dust cover paper. And typically uh, the process of doing that is after your frame is finished in the back, usually the last piece of material uh, that we put in in the States would be a piece of five millimeter foam board. Yeah. And that would be one of the last pieces that would sort of drop into the back of the frame. And then you would use a tool, maybe something like this. This is our dual driver that actually drives the points into the back of the, the rabbit and it secures the glazing and the mounted artwork and then the backing board, which in most cases is five millimeter uh, foam board. And then uh, after you finish with that, you can run sort of a bead of tape very much like this or use this exact tape around all four sides of the back of the frame. Just keep the tape in a little bit from the outside edge. You don't want it all the way in. And then if you lay your your sheet of craft paper down, you pick your frame up, and you literally just drop it, let it fall down onto the paper, and you can sort of trim the excess with scissors or, or a knife okay. or something. When you flip it over, you sort of use your fingers to sort of crease the paper so it's sort of folded over the outside edges. And then you would take this tool, and there's a little knob that you're going to loosen, and a little blade cover just slips back just to oh, expose okay. the tip of the blade here. And the reason why that there's two different posts on here is right now it's set up to be used right-handed, so you would hold it in your right hand and draw this along the back edge of the, of the frame on all four sides to trim the paper back. If you wanted to flip this and put the blade on this side and the blade cover on this side, then it's for left-handed people to pull it left-handed. Wow, great. Mm -hmm. They'll be very happy because a lot of people with equipment, and that's something actually yes. even with uh, the other Logan cutters, I know that the wider uh, 4,000 or three or 4,000 cutter head, I think that's, that's what it's still called, um, is great for left-handers to push yes because they can. they can actually see the guide still because it's right. not underneath their their hand so right. it's great that you make products for both people they just <laughs> seem to find a way you know sometimes left-handed people will ask me what's the best way to do it i'm not left-handed so i can't yeah. tell them but i can tell them what i've seen other left-handed mm -hmm. people do and i've seen them where they operate the machine from the opposite end and they will pull a push style cutter or they will push 
they pull style cutter with their left hand. Or sometimes they just overcome and just use their right hand. I really can't tell them what's the best. Yeah. But I've never had anybody say I can't use your cutting material or your cutting uh, equipment because I'm left-handed. So yeah. one way or the other, they adapt. And this is certainly one of the uh, tools that we make that, that actually has a, a specific uh, left or right-handed use. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this one is actually, I haven't I haven't got a picture in here, but I did, mm -hmm. I did put some... Um, five mil foam board in there mm -hmm. and I was hoping uh, that you could actually uh, pin that in and I'll try Only. to put some double sided on there with one of our guns okay. this time and we'll get some brown paper. So the dual drive uh, loads points in the front edge here and I can see you have some rigid points in here right yeah. now coming across, and it drops right down into a channel that's in the front of the tool here and you just sort of shut the tool with the, with the uh, piece on the top here. And then the nose of the tool, you're just going to put it on the inside of the rabbit, and you're just going to pull this lever, kind of mm -hmm. like a staple gun. And you can see it drives your points here. Yeah. Now, you just want to space your points out reasonably, and you don't want to get them too close to the corners. Just leave them a little ways from each of the corners. And when you drive the point, just sort of pull more back on the tool rather than lifting straight mm -hmm. up. You don't want to catch the point and possibly loosen it. Now, what you're using here are rigid points. Yes. And this is called the dual drive because it not only will drive a rigid point like we're using here, but it will also do a flexible point, which is a soft black metal point that can be bent up and down if you wanted to change your pictures out. The rigid point is really a more of a permanent, and it's certainly going to be better for hardwood. So if yeah. you're using a hardwood frame, you're probably going to have to use the rigid points because the flexible ones will probably crinkle up on you and not drive right. In any event, if you're not getting the, the depth of the drive that you want, there's a tension knob on the back of the tool here, and if you just turn this in a little bit, it loads the spring harder, and then it gives you a little bit harder punch on the on the way you drive it. So it's very simple. Works yeah, like that. Yeah, it does drive it in further. I've, your your tool would be the only one that I've seen, and in fact, your other little uh, manual driving mm -hmm. tool, fitting tool, fitting tool. Right. That's another great tool. I, I actually use that quite a bit with fragile media mm. with things like charcoal or right. pastel because you don't, idea. you don't want that kick. There's so no impact. No impact. And the fact that that takes four different uh, pins yes. and this takes two, I don't think there's anything else on the market that would take, you know, there are ones that take specific staples or that sort of thing, but this is really a well thought out tool mm. that any home framer would be yes. crazy not to have You're because right. it, it delivers such a good result. Um, so then you put that all the way around mm -hmm. and uh, just drive a few more in here. Yes, this certainly beats the old method of people trying to use pliers and a ball pin hammer and drive in like or the old the, brad points or something or, like or that. Or the old glazier's points, that yes. little, those little diamonds, the little the triangle triangles or diamonds were yes, absolutely a nightmare. Oh. Well, before we were using the, the other one, but I'll pop some of that tape on. So you put it in a little bit in from, the, little edge, bit in from like, the edge. Like mm -hmm. how cl is that? Is that about right there? Yeah, little, it's, yeah just a little, little bit, bit of a distance. Even a little bit closer to Maybe the edge. You can go a little bit. Yeah, I think actually you're fine. If anything, you might look, work a little bit more into the uh, rabbit of the frame. Okay. You just okay. don't want to get too far to the outside because the tool is going to trim it right down in here. And you want to make sure that you have tape everywhere. Don't have any open spots where the paper won't adhere to the back of the frame. Okay. So yeah, this is this is one of our very old long serving guns. We've we've got it we've got it taped up and yeah. we just I know that tool they, well. they, 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 get, they get thrown around in the workshop and uh, although it's an old tool it's still effective. So mm. I've put some double sided all the way around there, Brian. Maybe okay. and uh, this is just some of the um, eighty five gram uh, craft paper. Mm -hmm. uh, that works just fine. Nothing, not real fancy what you're using here. I don't believe it's even necessarily acid free and it doesn't really matter because it's on the back of your frame anyway. So the technique I use is I'll usually lay the paper down and then I'll the, take my frame, which you have put the double sided tape on all four sides, and just sort of literally drop it. Oh, that's a good technique. Mm -hmm. And then if I have a little razor blade or something, I can... We've just got a, a, yeah, an open perfect. blade there, right? That's perfect. perfect. Do you want me to put it's a, okay, a board underneath, or you? No, if I just can trim it, is that okay on this material? Yeah, here? pretty much, just slightly. Or maybe even scissors might even be a little bit quicker. I just want to trim this. Yeah, there we go. Just sort of want to give it a, a general trim on all four sides here. This is your first initial sort of trimming of the paper, so it's not too uh, 
too much you're having to work with here. Well, I was always intrigued uh, by the fact that it was called brown craft paper. And I started to have a look into why it was called craft paper, because it was spelt with a K. Mm. And, you know, originally people would say, oh, it's brown craft paper, because craft people use it. Mm. But the, the derivative actually came from craft, K-R-A-F-T, which in German was strong. So oh, it's okay. strong, strong brown paper. Oh, really? And, um, okay, so yeah, go. it's it's sort of stuck. So brown craft paper. Good to know um, that. And in fact, even uh, you know, there's all the old wives' tales and things. I can remember my old Swedish grandmother using brown craft paper uh -huh. around her stomach when travelling because she believed it aided uh, against travel sickness. Really? Yeah. Oh, quite okay. amazing. I've never heard of that <laughs> that before. <laughs> Okay, so all I've done now is just sort of crease the, the paper around the four edges yep. here. So we just take and uh, we actually still had it ready to go. You just make sure the little nose piece is slipped back here, the blade cover, yep. so that the tip of the blade is, is exposed. And you're just going to place it along the side here right at the very start. And there's a little bit of an offset on how the tool sort of sits onto the paper. And you're just going to draw the tool right along all four sides. And, you know, the object here is not to dig the razor blade really deeply into the wood. All you're trying to do is just trim the paper off. So, maybe a couple of times practicing with this, you'll get better. If you're going too deep at first, you'll, you'll certainly know that. So, does this tool use the uh, 270 blade? Yes, it does. One? It's so, the exact one. You could, in theory, use some of the older blades after bevel cutting or would yeah, you Yeah, I think you probably could. Yeah. I don't think you have necessarily have to change the blade on this near as often as you would on um, say the bevel cutters of yeah. the, the mat cutting equipment. And I think we're at our final side here. Go over this area just a little bit now the paper's kind of bubbling up. Let's see what we got here. Maybe just a little bit there. Just a little the frame, tiny bit right the, there. The frame might be a little bit uneven actually on the back. This was just give a little bit of tilt down. Yeah, there you go. You got it. And this usually falls off the back. We did a nice job. It comes off of a square of paper. Just one, just one little bit there, but that. Wow, that's a really neat tool. Mm -hmm. You can see how that, that trims it back. It makes, makes it look very pro professional. Now, the next thing that I typically do to really make this look pro is you get a water bottle. Okay. And you're going to spray this paper. You yeah. want to soak it. You don't want to soak it, soak it, but you do want to get it nice and wet. And then take a hair dryer. Or you can let it sit for, for an hour or two. Yeah. But if you take in a hair dryer, in about two or three minutes, you hold the hair dryer against the wet paper, and it will tighten that paper up like a drum. Yeah, it will look very, very professional. This actually came out really, really nice. That's pretty good, yeah. I'm not even sure I would have to do it here, but I probably would. It really would tighten it up. And then from this point, you're ready to put your hanging hardware on, whether it be a sawtooth, depending on what format this is. You can do a sawtooth, or if there was weight to the picture, then of course you'd come down about uh, a third of the way and drive in your D-rings and run your wire and put your, your bumpers on the back, and then you're ready to uh, present it on the wall. Yeah. Well, certainly the tape and, and uh, shrink making uh, that, that paper shrink does actually aid quite a bit to the strength of the overall frame because mm -hmm. that's holding all those points mm -hmm. hard in and holding the frame hard against the points. So that's right. a really good tip to actually moisten that and have it have it uh, have mm -hmm. it shrink. I, I really like how um, how it actually has cut in from the edge. I mean, I thought that um, you know a lot of the time when we're trying to trim things like this it's too very easy if you're just using a Stanley knife or even a blade mm -hmm. to actually slip and damage the external edge yes. of the frame. That's right. But with this tool, I can't see that you would, there is no risk of really splitting the wood or, no. or, or harming the actual exterior, no. which is which is really good. So I think the guys in our workshop will be using these for all sorts of training. <laughs> I, I can see that a handy little thing. coming on. So, um, well, that's really all I think we, we've got to talk about today, Brian. I was, right. I was really, I was so happy that you 
were passing by and just decided <laughs> to duck in because uh, we don't often get to see it's a big trip to come over from the States. It is a big trip. <laughs> a long, long way from home. <laughs> yeah. But I'm having a lot of fun here. I'm enjoying myself. And, you know, I, I really hope you have a great time. I hope you get to see some of the sights, get to, you know, pat a kangaroo or a koala or, <laughs> or, or if you can get up to see the barrier reef it, there's some really We're going. Oh, there's some beautiful places we're and, going uh, for sure wonderful to welcome you to australia thank you sir i appreciate it thank thanks for so having much. me today i appreciate thank it thank you we'll see you next time bye-bye